uh, to, to the floor, uh, George and, and Brad Wave, the story is clearly based on, on a true one. You took the decision to, to change some of the names in there. I just wonder what the reason was for that and what it allowed you to do dramatically with, with the film. <laughs> You go. All right, you go. Okay, I'll go. Uh, we, want, we wanted to change the names. Obviously, some of the people are pretty recognizable. Uh, uh, Rose Vallon, uh, who was a, a, a hero in the, to the French. But we wanted to be able to uh, tell a story much like most films do. We weren't doing a documentary. We didn't want to give any of these real men flaws that would be in any way upsetting to the, the, their families. If you get a little bit of a drinking problem, or if you have a, a little bit of a flirtation with a, with a, a certain um, curator, you know, I, we just wanted there to be our, our ability uh, to be able to tell the story without it having uh, without offending anyone. Uh, most films do that. You know, Into Arabia is quite completely accurate, but we still appreciate it. I, I think that that was the point of it. Grant, I should, uh, I should. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, so we, want to, we just wanted to be able to, uh, you know, we wanted to be able to tell the story in a compelling way, you know, and, uh, and be able to compromise some stuff. Okay, Claire, I think you'd like to open. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, it's a question to all the panel, please. Um, the, the film captures a great camaraderie and, and sense of humour and team spirit, and I just wondered how important that is that it existed offset as well as on. <laughs> uh, you know, I think if you, if you talk to each, you know, uh, yeah, it was hard to get these guys to work, actually, because all they want to do is play around with each other. <laughs> well, that came off. I mean, uh, <laughs> I said play around with each other. I couldn't get out of John Goodman's room. <laughs> uh, that's the quote that will be on the cover of all the magazines. <laughs> um, yeah, we're, we're all fans. We all, we, we all get along. It was really wonderful. Time and we'll shoot, but we didn't lose sight of the idea that we were talking about uh, fairly important issues along the way too, and so that everybody handled it, I think, with the, with the proper uh, care, even though there was a, a, a lot of. Well, George actually had to work. George and Grant wrote the script, and they were producing the movie. George was directing it and starring in it. Um, <coughs> the rest of us are kind of used to headlining movies and carrying them, and, and so when. When you get in an ensemble like this and you're working like two days a week, um, it's really, really fun. And, uh, and we all just kept reminding each other to smell the roses and appreciate the fact that this we were in a really great movie with a director who was great and had everything under control. And, and we just laughed a lot, basically. Matt was the only one working two days a week, John. <laughs> <laughs> we just didn't tell him. Anybody else like to comment on the, the camaraderie or the, or the, the humour as well, which underpins it? <laughs> yeah. First time I've ever had done a film with my pants on. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's just the spirit of everyone. Everyone that was very respectful towards uh, each other. We, we appreciated each other. I was very grateful to be cast in this film. And, uh, there's, because George did such a careful preparation, um, it made each day easier and uh, more fun. Okay. Um, Darren, I think we've got a question for George. Um, the movies that you make as a director and, and pro um, producer tend to be um, interesting, true stories, maybe small um, stories that we didn't know about. Mm -hmm. um, but they're very different from the films that you made as an actor early on in your career. Yeah, you meet Batman and Robin. <laughs> I thought you that was an independent film uh, of man in a rubber suit with nipples. <laughs> but I wonder if that was always part of a plan to sort of get your profile as high as possible, maybe earn a bit of money as well, and then move on to these sort of stories that you wanted to tell. No, he, he was trying to make Batman and Robin an art film. <laughs> <laughs> it felt like such a good chance. It's kind of amazing if you go back and rewatch it. <laughs> if you watch it with the sound off and not then the color turned off, it really it looks like an art film. Um, uh, you know, I did a lot of film. You know, early on in your career, you just take jobs because you're excited to get them. And a lot of those the, the times, uh, uh, they aren't always necessarily the best of jobs. But look, every one of them led to another place for me. And for a while, 
we would do films and we'd say one for the studio and one for us. And you know, as I've gotten older, it's a little less of that. We, we sort of try to work as much of the uh, around the, the kind of away from the comic book, you know, the big blockbuster films. And we try to, as long as we keep the budgets down on the films, we're able to, be, you know, from Good Night, Good Luck to Eyes of March to you know, uh, uh, Michael Clayton to uh, you know, the Descendants or up in the air, as long as you keep the budgets down, keep them way down, you're able to sort of work around the periphery of the larger budget films because they'll still make a profit. Okay, and um, there are several questions in this, uh, the third row. We'll start with this gentleman here and we move the microphone along. Thank you. It's a question uh, for the cast. Uh, it's a fascinating story, which I'm ashamed to say I was completely unaware. And of course, the movie raises the question where art belongs. Obviously, it's universal, but there's certain particular, for example, the Elgin Marbles, something like that. Apparently, I, I got in trouble saying so. <laughs> I just wondered if anyone would like to comment on that particular issue, because it's been a sore point of contention, as you all know, between Britain and Greece. And it's very much a part, I think, of their background and their culture, yet of course it or so much of it resides here. And this is a sort of question that the film like this, I think, throws up. Well, I kind of got, I stepped into one the other day. I was at a press conference like this and somebody brought it up. And um, so I had to do a little research to make sure I wasn't completely out of my mind. Um, even in England, the polling is in favor of uh, returning uh, the the marbles from the Pantheon, the Pantheon of marbles. Um, I don't know, look, it, 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 the, um, uh, the Vatican returned parts of it, uh, the Getty returned parts of it. It's not, it is a question in that case of just breaking up one piece of art and whether or not one piece of art should be as best as possible put back together. Obviously it can't be completely put back together. So it's an argument to say, maybe that's, a, that's one of those instances. It's not about giving, you're never gonna be able to you know, I, I think the bust of Nefertiti should be given back. You know, there's certain pieces that you look at and you think, that actually probably, the, probably the right thing to do. Um, I know that uh, some, someone uh, yesterday said that, you know, he's probably, he's an American and he doesn't understand, and it's like, well, he's probably right. I'm, you know, I'm not very proud. But that can't always be the British team that said it. I mean, seriously. <laughs> That's not actually an argument. You can't just say, well, you're American, you don't get it. <laughs> but I do, think, I do think that it's worth having an open discussion, which is an obviously ongoing discussion, but it really wasn't meant to be, you know, that was a one in about a hundred questions at a press conference from a Greek reporter asking me about the, the marbles, and I said, you know, and, and I, I said that I thought it was probably a good idea that they found their way back. Well, you're American, you don't understand. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> Any of the rest of the panel like to, to comment on that? You'd ask for a couple of other, other comments? Returning of the, the art? It seems like it's a problem all over the world. Who owns this art? Who, where did it come from? <clears throat> where it came from? Do they have the right to give it back? And I think, you know, it's had a very nice stay here. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly, but, uh, you know, it's, London's gotten crowded. <laughs> and, uh, there's a plenty of room back there in Greece, plenty of room. And, but England could take the lead on, on this kind of thing, of like, uh, you know, bringing, letting, letting art go back where it came from. And then if they were all together, you know, the Greeks are nothing but generous. They loan it back every once in a while, like, like people do with art, right? Yeah. Um, there's a gentleman here in the side from then a lady who... Uh, Exactly the same question, but I would, instead I would say, um, are any of you, particularly you, George, um, your uh, your outspoken nature on this? Uh, planning to visit the British Museum? Is anything that a model there? We're here. Uh, we leave tonight at, uh, at the end of the premiere to go to Paris uh, to somehow insult the Parisianers about it. <laughs> <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> something about Mona Lisa in Italy or something. <laughs> uh, go over and play well. Uh, so no, I don't think we're going to get a chance to go. Well, I mean, this this weekend or this day. What day is it? Okay, and then the gentleman here, and then we come to the lady. Yeah. 
question for George, and not related to this film. What in particular were you trying to say about the effect that art has on individuals and on society, and how would you hope you, you succeeded? Well, I don't know. I don't know if it succeeds or not. You never know how, how it succeeds. Time sort of figures that out. Um, what we were doing was talking about the, 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 the work that Harry and all of his friends, all of his comrades did, which was that it wasn't just that Hitler was trying to to destroy, and he wasn't just trying to kill everyone and to take their land. He was also trying to destroy their culture and say that they didn't exist. And uh, and that was, to, to me, that is the most important part of what these men did. They did amazing work in protecting even uh, pieces like The Last Supper that we saw, uh, which we didn't do a great job of protecting, uh, from ourselves, from us bombing, you know, and while we were prosecuting the war, which were casualties of war. But at the end, what was important was to find and return for the first time in the history of war, uh, the victory didn't keep the spoils. It's never happened before. And, uh, and it was important because you know, when you see Hitler burning uh, Salvador Dali's and you see him burning um, uh, Picasso's, he's t telling you that this, this time period and this era and this group of men didn't exist. And, uh, and I've seen that happen in other countries. I've been to the Sudan, and you'll see that it's not enough to kill them. You have to destroy all of their, all of the, the, the <laughs> markings that they left that were their history. So to me, what was important about telling the story was also to say that uh, is art worth dying for? I don't know a single inanimate object is worth dying for. But if it means that you're going to try to erase my history and say that I never was here, then I think that's very much worth dying for. And I thought that was a, what these men were so brave uh, in doing, and I thought that was an interesting story to tell. Okay, um, the lady here in the third row, and the lady in the fourth row, I'll get the microphone down here. Hi, um, usually um, war films are quite hard hitting and overbearing sometimes, so when did you guys mean to approach it as a comedy, or was that something that came up while writing the script or during filming? Crunch, would you like to start on that? Uh, we always knew that we wanted to have humor in, in this piece. Uh, uh, George and I, I grew up watching a lot of the, you know, the war films of our youth, and they, a lot of them had sort of a gallows humor, and, and, and you know, these kind of guys dealt with this situation with humor, and we deal with life with humor. So we always knew that we wanted to have some, some funny tone, but we also knew that there were, you know, we were dealing with a subject that uh, there was, a, uh, you know, that was very serious in, in nature. So there was a real balancing act that we did, and that was, that really was the, the fun of making the piece, was trying to strike that, that, that balance and that tone. And then we cast all these guys, and they brought like another level of humor to it that we didn't, we didn't write. Lowered. A lower level, that's right. <laughs> they lowered the level of humor. Oh, right, yeah. Uh, it's a question for George. George, you were in the paper, in the area of the our paper, filming your basic training scenes. And I was just wondering if there was any basic training that took place, or was it more just uh, having a laugh together in preparation? Uh, I think uh, I think uh, John should take that question, John. <laughs> was there a lot of uh, basic training? Basic training. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> it involved a knife and a fork. <laughs> <laughs> it's the most basic kind of training. Yeah. Basic training. <laughs> uh, Bill, did you have any uh, basic training? I had some basic training too. Uh, mine involved, um, I, you know, I, you know, it's a movie really about men. But I learned things from women on this film. I learned that when you have to put on a tight pair of pants, you lie on your back. <laughs> Isn't that really? Isn't that what you do? You put your feet up in the air and lie on your back. I'd just like to say something about. Um, Could have done this film as easily as we did without the um, expert mm. knowledge of Joe Hobbs, yeah. who um, was from this country. I've worked with him several times before. He is an, was an expert at, at, at military uniforms, kit, gear. Uh, he knew what belonged where to which army, and um, he had a very exacting eye. And we lost him around Christmas time, and I just like to pay tribute to Joe Hobbs.
Uh, Simon, you've got a question. Right, question for Bob first. And then for Matt, if I may, although Bob's not listening. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we have to answer the question, Bob. Answer the question. <laughs> private discussion, excuse me. Okay. <laughs> Having been directed by the likes of Steven Spielberg, I wondered how you assess Mr. Clooney's skills behind the camera. And for Matt, what is it like being told to do stuff by essentially mate? It, it, it makes you very unhappy. <laughs> <laughs> it feels impossible, but we don't talk about it particularly. Um, what do you have to say about that, Bill? <laughs> <laughs> I think there's some confusion here. <laughs> okay, back to Bob again. How do you rate Mr. Clooney as a director compared to, say, the likes of Steven Spielberg? He's one of the best directors I've ever worked with. Uh, that's the serious part. The, the other part is we really had fun. To me, good work happens when somebody knows what they're doing. This is George. Plans what they're doing. That's works. Yeah. No <laughs> that hack. <laughs> he's a really hard worker and he makes it look easy because he kind of knows the secret because he's been an actor for a few months. Um, he knows you have to be relaxed and happy when you're working, and it's uh, and it works. It's great. And then from that, what's it like sort of being directed by someone who's essentially young? It's actually it's actually much easier to be directed by a friend. I, having written screenplays with friends, um, it's 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 when you're partnering with somebody who's a friend of yours, um, you cut out all of the diplomacy, which really wastes a lot of time. And <clears throat> there's there's all this there's a whole way to speak you're supposed to speak to each other on film sets or in the theater, you know, and it's all about protecting people's egos and their feelings, but when you're working with your friend, they just say, that sucked, <laughs> you know, and there's a baseline of trust and that never comes into question and you get, you, 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 pro you solve the problems a lot quicker and so it's a lot more fun, and so it makes it more fun because you're getting stuff done faster, uh, you're feeling good about what you're doing and, um, and, uh, and you're having a good time because you're with your friends. And talking about having a good time, John and Jean Dujardin, you probably have said your adieu after the artist. Uh, how did you enjoy being reunited for this? <coughs> uh, oui, oui, c'est un plaisir. Et effectivement, c'est un plaisir. Et uh, c'est uh, toujours un. Enfin, moi, c'était très différent. C'était un plaisir d'être avec tout le monde, évidemment, et d'avoir mes scènes avec John. For me, it was very different. It was a pleasure to be with everybody, of course, and to have my scenes with John. Parce que ce que j'aime bien avec John, c'est qu'on ne se dérange pas. I like, what I like about being with John is that we, we, we don't bother each other. J'aime beaucoup, je... Non, mais j'aime beaucoup. J'aime beaucoup ses silences. I, I love his silences. Et, et j'en ai aussi moi-même beaucoup. And I have a lot of them too. Et j'ai le sentiment qu'on commence à jouer avant l'action, tous les deux. And I have this feeling that we both we start to act before the actual. C'est toujours, c'est toujours très respectueux et euh, et je, même si on se connaît pas bien, je, je sens qu'il y a, je sais qu'il y a beaucoup de, de tendresse. And it's always very respectful, and even if we don't really know each other well, I, I feel that there's a lot of tenderness. I love you, John. <laughs> I didn't know he was French. <laughs> There's a lady in the second row with the next question. Hello. Um, talking of having fun on set, we heard there was um, a few pranks between Matt and George, and I wonder whether you could talk about that, please. Well, we did, you know, I actually was busy, so I didn't really do a whole lot of thing, <laughs> but there was one situation. Matt showed up early when we were about to start shooting and said he wanted to lose a couple of pounds. He'd be fine, but he said he wanted to lose a couple of pounds. So and stupid. you should never have told me that. <laughs> So over a period of about a month and a half, he would come and go, he would come to the set, he would work for a couple of weeks, and then he'd go back to LA for a couple of weeks. And every time he would go away, I would have the wardrobe girl just take in his uniform, just like <laughs> half an inch. Uh, and he was eating like a grape. And then he, his pants were getting tighter. And I, I never actually discussed it with him. I found out only a few days ago that it really disturbed you. Yeah, I, I, I never said anything because I thought I was being professional and trying to lose weight and it wasn't working and, and uh, uh, my favorite prank he actually did was was uh, his father's in the movie at the very end of the movie and it's this beautiful shot of him he's in this like really lovely scene he plays George as an old man and he walks off into the light you know as he's leaving the church at the end and George ran the film for him you know um, he just privately ran the film for his dad Nick and and at the end of the film this is my final shot of Nick walking away, faded to black, and 
and a crier came up and said, in loving memory of Nick Cooley. <laughs> 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 and so Nick is like, what the hell, George? <laughs> and George is like, well, I mean, it doesn't come out for like six months. <laughs> Much cheaper, it's much cheaper to take it off than it is to put it on. <laughs> and there's a lady here in, in red, and then we come back to the second row. Thank you. Hi. Um, sadly, there are very few of the actual monuments men still alive. You've got Harry sitting over there. What would you like to say to him? We've been saying a lot to him, so <laughs> I, 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 I would like to say, you know, the, the, when Dimitri, who did a wonderful job in this film, was playing Harry. Um, the things you see in the film about uh, Harry uh, uh, leaving Karlsruhe, Germany at 13 years old and coming to New Jersey of all places, and, uh, and then uh, when he was a little older, what do you mean the fourth place? <laughs> <laughs> and he, when he came back and then joined him back up in the army, he lived he, in his hometown, wasn't allowed to see Rembrandt's self-portrait. Uh, and did find it in the mine later. But there's also, Harry, why don't you tell the story of, of, your, of your grandfather's uh, drawings as well that you found, right, in the, in, in, the, in the mine? Yes, I was able to collect my grandfather's print collection, uh, which consisted of 3,000, that he had as a hobby a group of uh, uh, 1,500 prints that go into the inside cover of uh, books that people had acquired to have a library in their home and uh, uh, used to come along and teach them how to lead a better life. And, uh, and that was a, um, that was uh, prevalent in uh, former days before your days, and for that matter before mine, because I'm a young guy, and uh, uh, so, uh, but he was a, that was a hobby, that was great over here, and I was able to retrieve his, uh, his collection and uh, do something for my family at that particular time, in addition to doing something for my country, the USA. And second row, there's a gentleman that will move to the back. Uh, hi guys. Um, Sadly, Hugh isn't here today, so I was wondering whether any Downton discussions, or perhaps he's trying to recruit any of you guys, would you be having a little guest spot? Well, the reason Hugh's not here is because we didn't get along with him. We did. Uh, <laughs> we say, we, when we say we all got along, most of us got along. Also, not fans of, of that show, so. so. <laughs> We're going to have to get no, that. He's actually, he's actually working. Okay. Uh, on Downton Abbey. And we are, we are all fans, and, and it was great to have the, the Lord of the Manor there. He was. Uh, he was, uh, he's the Lord of the Manor. He's really quiet. Yeah, we actually wish he was here. He was with us in, uh, in Germany, but now he's, he's stuck working. So uh, he's missed right now because you would be asking him a lot of questions. We wouldn't have to ask That's what we're like, not here. <laughs> um, there's a cameraman, I think, at the back there with a burning question. So we're going to get the microphone just down to the chat room with his shirt. His name is Russell. We'll put you on the spot, Russ. Okay. Yeah. Come on to you quickly. Thank you. Um, congratulations, first of all, on a fantastic film. Um, I think obviously one of the questions that the film really does ask is um, what the world would be like without art and creativity in it. And I'm curious, um, this is a question for all of the panel, but perhaps uh, starting with Bill, what you imagine your life would have been like had you not discovered art and creativity? And if there's a specific moment in your lives you can pinpoint where art really has mattered to you and made a difference for you. Well, uh, I think it would, it would be back when I started uh, acting in Chicago. I wasn't very good, and uh, uh, I remember my first experience on the stage. I was so bad, I just walked out <laughs> out on the street and headed and started walking. And I walked for a couple of hours, and, and I realized I'd walked the wrong direction. Not, <laughs> not just the wrong direction in terms of where I live, but the wrong direction in terms of a desire to stay alive. Uh, <laughs> and, and so I, I, um, I maybe this may be a little bit not completely true, but it's pretty true that, that I walked. Uh, I then thought, well, 
if I'm going to die where I am, I may as well just go over towards the lake and, and maybe I'll float for a while after I'm dead. So I walked over towards the lake, and as I got there, I realized I'd hit Michigan Avenue. And I, and I thought, well, Michigan Avenue, that runs north, too. And so I started walking north, and I ended up in front of the Art Institute of Chicago. And I just walked inside, and I didn't feel like I had any place being there. And they, they used to ask you for <laughs> a donation, you know, when you walk into a museum. And I, didn't, I just walked right through because I was ready to die. And, uh, pretty much dead, and I walked in, and there's a painting there, and I don't even know who painted it, but it's, I think it's called, the, I think it's called the, um, the Song of the Lark, and it's a, it's a woman working in a field, and there's a sunrise behind her, and I've always loved this painting, and I saw it that day, and I just thought, well, look, there's a girl who doesn't have a whole lot of prospects, but <laughs> the sun's coming up anyway, and she's got a, another chance at it. So I, I think that gave me some sort of feeling that I, I, I too have, am, am a person and, and get another chance every day the sun comes up. I don't know if anyone can top that. We can quickly go along with the rest of the, the, rest of the panel. I can't, I can't, I can't top that. You can't top that. John, a moment I when you realize. I don't, I don't wish to embarrass Bill at this point. <laughs> George. I was going to tell the same story. <laughs> Matt's no way. No way. <laughs> oh. well, I had an interesting experience, but it wasn't as, as interesting as your experience, Bill. But um, a friend of ours was married to an art dealer, and uh, I wasn't quite sure what he did, and they invited us over for dinner one night. We're sitting at a table, a kind of a long, skinny table, in a very simple square room in a beautiful townhouse, and it turned out he was Mark Rothko's dealer, and there were eight Rothko's giant, it was a pretty big room, Two over here, two there, two behind us. We couldn't eat. And it's interesting because I've always struggled with certain kinds of abstract art. I mean, it took me a while to, to understand what I didn't understand about it. And some of you can't describe your words. Just being in the room with those paintings, the power really was, I mean, I was so glad because I hadn't responded much before to the things that I didn't understand. And I can't say the words but to be with those paintings in that room was a, a really a massive personal experience and I can't explain why, it was just, it was in there and it was coming out of us. Well, we, we couldn't eat, I mean, it was a terrible dinner, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Dimitri, have you a piece of art? Um, I think I'll just be reiterating what these two have said so well, so I'm, I'm gonna pass. Okay, and Jean, a moment when art moves so much to I agree. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I'm afraid that's where we're going to have to wrap it today. Would you show some kindness to our lovely guests?